Withholding Dissent, the Supreme Court during the Progressive Era by Austin Quant, mentor Professor Lisa Lane. During the late 19th century and early 20th century, the United States was in the Progressive Era, in which there is an increase of social activism along with economic and political reform. The way the government and politics function changed in this era, and therefore, New progressive legislation frequently passed across the country on all levels of government. However, when the legitimacy of progressive legislation was tried by the Supreme Court during this era, the court frequently voted against upholding these policies. During the progressive era, the Supreme Court rejected progressive social and, uh, and economic policies because the majority of the court had an originalist activist leaning ideology. The Progressive Era is a period in American history which begins in the late 19th century and lasts through the early 20th century. During this era, there is an increase in social, economic, and political activism that sought reform of the already existing structures within society. The increase in activism occurred due to problems caused by industrialization, political corruption, and urbanization. Due to the increased desire for rapid change of society, historians often refer to this time period as the Progressive Era. According to the Constitution, the Supreme Court has the power vested in it to determine if a law is considered constitutionally legal, that is, whether the Constitution would allow such a law to be enacted and enforced, and whether the legislative body that passed the law had the power to do so. As a result, the Supreme Court has the ability to permit or deny laws that are passed through the process of hearing and trying cases. The Supreme Court ruled against progressive social and economic legislation due to the majority of the justices applying the practice of textualism. Textualism is a judicial philosophy and practice in which the judge applies the original meaning of a text to the case. The U.S. Constitution implies that all U.S. citizens have rights to general welfare and protected fundamental rights. General welfare is the idea that the government must protect the, in the freedom and liberty of the citizens. Fundamental rights are rights viewed by the government as needing higher protection, such as the right against exploitation. A defining case during the Progressive Era was the case Launcher v. New York which occurred in 1905. During this case, the S Supreme Court ruled that states could not set time limits of working for workers. In the opinion of the court, Justice Peckham describes how the right to general welfare is attacked when he writes, the statute necessarily interferes with the right of contract between the employer and employees concerning the number of hours in which the latter may labor in the bakery of the employer, which signals that the law to limit the amount of time workers can spend working was considered unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. In this example, the court views the general welfare right as the freedom for the individual to make a contract with their employer, as well as having the liberty to choose how much time they work. The court determined that the fundamental right of the government to protect the worker from exploitation does not overrule the general welfare right. The justices believe that the general welfare of the individual was of greater value in the Constitution. Therefore, they did not try to apply the Constitution in modern terms or try to determine if there was an example in which the Constitution could do more harm to the people, such as workers being forced to work excessive hours in which the fundamental rights of the individual would be insulted. They strictly followed their ideology of examining the Constitution the way it was written. In the case, Adar v. the United States, which occurred in 1914, the court ruled that bans on yellow dogs contracts, which forbid workers from joining unions, were unconstitutional. In the opinion of the court, 
Justice Harlan describes how the freedom of contract under general welfare rights extends to the sale of an individual's labor when he writes, Such liberty and right embrace the right to make contracts for the purchase of the labor of others and equally the right to make contracts for the sale of one's own labor. The court again used a close interpretation of the meaning of the Constitution to make the decision that banning yellow dog contracts would interfere on an individual's right to contract, therefore making the law unconstitutional. However, the court does not look at the circumstances of modern society in which forbidding workers from joining unions could deprive the individuals from having protected fundamental rights. The court focuses on upholding the Constitution the way in which it was written and applying that strict meaning to society during the Progressive Era. The 14th Amendment was also used as the basis to reject progressive legislation by the Supreme Court. This amendment was established in 1868 and declared that every citizen should be given equal protection under the law. In the Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, the court ruled that it was legally constitutional for there to be racial discrimination laws so long as segregated places were equal in quality. Justice Brown, who gave the opinion of the court, stated that the 14th Amendment permitted discrimination when he writes, the objective of the object of the amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a coming of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. This highlights that the majority of the justices applied the original intention of the 14th Amendment to the case. They viewed the 14th Amendment through the lens it was written to help end slavery and create more equality in the United States, while at the same time failing to address the end of segregation. Due to the justices' ideology, the court chose to interpret the 14th Amendment in the manner in which it was written and applied that meaning to the case. Therefore, the justices did not see there being a legal problem with segregation and permitted the discrimination laws to remain in place. In the article, A Tale of Two Launchers, The Untold History of Substantive Due Process and the Idea of Fundamental Rights, author Victoria Norse describes how the Supreme Court favored rights to freedom, but she states, During the Progressive Era, Courts assumed general welfare rights existed prior to any written constitution, and enumeration was no grand ideal rights, were defined negatively by drawing limits on federal and state power. Norse illustrates how during this era many legal scholars and justices thought that general welfare rights, liberty, and freedom were naturally awarded just by living. However, these rights to freedom were sometimes infringed upon while trying to ensure that everyone had fundamental rights, which allowed people to have a better quality of life living in society. The justices viewed the Constitution in the context for which it was written, which was following a war fought for freedom. A lot of progressive legislation tried to use government regulation in order to protect the people. However, the justices saw this as a violation of the Constitution, which upheld the individuals right to liberty they did not try to apply the new needs of society rather examining only the original meaning of the constitution causing them to rule in favor of freedom rights the supreme court during the progressive era ruled against progressive policies because the court used conservative judicial activism judicial activism is the practice of choosing to hear and try cases involving laws passed by congress or the president along with striking down laws passed by Congress or the President. In the court case, Hammer v. Doggenhart, which took place in 1918, the Supreme Court ruled that a federal law regulating child labor was unconstitutional. In the opinion of the court, Justice Day describes how the law is invalid due to Congress not having the power to streamline economic policies when he writes, 
There is no power vested in Congress to require the states to exercise their police power so as to prevent possible unfair competition. This depicts how the, how the court took the opinion that they should follow and apply judicial review in their decisions. The court applied the idea that this law should be struck down because Congress could not create a certain economic policy, which was creating restrictions on minors in the workforce, which would apply to every state. At the time the law was written, each state had different rules of minors in the workplace, while this law would create a nationwide law on the subject. The court chose to pick a part one part of the law instead of focusing on the overall purpose of the law, and in their opinion, found a reason for it to be considered unconstitutional. Given that this law was intended to protect minors, a Supreme Court which was practicing judicial restraint would have looked at the whole law and likely would have allowed it to remain intact. However, since the majority of the justices had a conservative ideology, they were actively looking to strike down laws which did not follow their ideology for any given reason. This idea is also expanded in the case Pollock v. Farmers, which occurred in 1895. In this case, the Supreme Court found the income tax imposed by the wilson Gorman Tariff Act to be unconstitutional. In the opinion of the court, Justice Fuller uses the idea of taxation without representation to detail why the law is unconstitutional when he states, Nothing can be clearer than that what the Constitution intended to, to guard against was the exercise by the general government of the power of, direct, of directly taxing persons and property within any state through a majority made up of other states. The justices are arguing that this law is not constitutionally acceptable because Congress is composed of members from every state and each state has its right to not be taxed without representation. According to this argument, smaller states may not have as much representation in Congress and therefore should not be forced to follow the tax laws set. The Supreme Court looked at this case through an originalist point of view and therefore felt that Congress was conducting taxation without representation, which they saw as a breach of Congress's power. This represents how the Supreme Court challenged the power that Congress has in order to keep progressive policies from being established in this country. The court used their vested power to declare laws unconstitutional because they wanted to control the path the nation was going on. In the article, the Supreme Court, 1888-1940, an empirical overview, authors Sandra Wood, Keith Linda, Lena Drew, and Angundele Ayu write about patterns which occurred in the Supreme Court during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The authors describe how David Curry once noted that in the Progressive Era Supreme Court, activism protect, protecting economic interests contracts sharply with the judicial restraint of its predecessors. This illustrates how the Supreme Court during the Progressive Era had used their power to declare more laws unconstitutional than prior courts. It was not normal for the Supreme Court to be actively striking down so many laws that the elected legislative body was enacting. The Supreme Court had a pattern of taking parts of laws of progressive economic and social policies and declaring them unconstitutional without looking at the intent of the whole law or how the law could be applied legally within the new needs of society. The court increased the practice of judicial review to check the constitutional legitimacy of progressive laws that were being voted into law by Congress. Progressive policies during this era aimed at transforming the social and economic system. The Supreme Court during the Progressive Era ruled against progressive legislation because the court wanted to ensure social stability in the United States. In the article, Anti-Canonizing Courts, the author Jamal Green describes how in order to understand why the Supreme Court voted against progressive legislation, people should know that the culture that those judges are part underlies actions we now believe to be unethical or immoral. Green is trying to depict that society in the late 19th and early 20th century was very different from modern society.
As a result, society was not as equal as it is today, and therefore changes in social and economic legislation aimed at bringing more justice often received more of a polarized reaction. Since the justices on the court had a conservative ideology, they were not looking for change in society and wanted to keep social structures the way they were. Even if the majority of the general population had voted in members of Congress who supported progressive legislation, the court was not afraid to use the practice of judicial activism to ensure social stability. In the case Pussy v. Ferguson, the court used the idea of anti-social structural change in the decision to not end segregation. In the photo, Ku Klux Klan, which was taken in 1921, the photograph depicts people with white sheets draped over them, presumably members of the Ku Klux Klan. This image illustrates how during the Progressive Era, people were still very racist and against social change. Since the justices on the Supreme Court tended to have more conservative values, they took advantage of the fact that society was in a different time period. However, this disregarded the changing attitudes of the majority of the general public. This idea about ensuring social stability continued in the case Mueller v. Oregon, which took place in 1908. In this case, the Supreme Court upheld a law that limited female workers to working 10 hours per day, which may have been a rare win for progressive economic policies. It was a complete loss for progressive social movements, specifically the women's suffrage movement. Since the Supreme Court voted down a law to limit the working hours of men in Lancashire v. New York in 1905, by the court agreeing to uphold this law, women were then not able to work the same amount of time as men, which created an unequal playing field. The cartoon, Shall Women Vote, which was drawn in 1909, shows several men in line at a polling place, with one man sticking out his hand at an illustration of a woman taking care of children with chains surrounding this image. This image illustrates how women struggled for the right to vote which is just one example of the many inequalities for women which plague society during this time. This relates to the case since the ruling in Mueller v. Oregon essentially stated that women do not have equal rights to men regarding women's right to negotiate a contract. The majority of the justices continue to keep the social structure of inequalities in place by upholding this law, which followed the conservative ideology the Supreme Court during the Progressive Era had a conservative ideology during a time of social and economic transformation. Therefore, the court frequently used judicial activism to check and strike down the progressive laws which were being passed by Congress and even state legislators. The use of textualism, judicial review, and applying the practice of ensuring social order were all used by the court to not uphold progressive legislation. The Supreme Court was able to use their power to influence the direction of the country and slow down the inevitable change which was occurring. Thank you for listening.